program of a book reading. We do book readings um, about a, once a quarter here at the center, and we're really excited to uh, have uh, Sean Strub. Did I say your last name right? Stroop. Stroop. Oh, okay. I've been emailing, so I can. Um, I have my like weird ways of seeing things and then pronouncing them. Um, and he's the author of Body Counts and has been. Uh, this morning I heard on NPR uh, and. And we're super psyched to have him read part of his book, which is a memoir. And I'm gonna, he's going to uh, talk more about it and then um, do some interviews here with some people that are from the press and then do some question and answer. So, uh, and he is touring um, Chicago. How long are you in Chicago? For just today? Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. So it's fast. So we're really <laughs> lucky to have him. So I would like to open with a warm applause. And So, well, I'm here because the center also was uh, very generous in putting this together and tonight I'm in a class positive aware network and we've been having a conversation with Jeff Barry. So, your appetite is uh, wet and you, you just need more. You can do, do come tonight as well. Um, so, the book, um, um, it is a memoir. So it's my personal story about my life and relationships and work and getting sick and getting better and uh, lots of things that for those of you of my generation where I see a few people here with gray hair and, uh, will, will you know, find a lot of things familiar in it. Uh, but it's also an historical memoir. So it uh, tells the story uh, of uh, not just the epidemic but the gay rights movement uh, from someone who sort of grew up with it from the, I guess, from the inside or from the front lines. <clears throat> and, you know, I resisted writing about the epidemic uh, after my health came back. Uh, and, you know, I was a different person. I think I came very close to death. And, um, uh, and I wanted to do something other than, than AIDS. The epidemic had hijacked my life, and I had other things I wanted to do. And then a few years ago, I was trying to, I was in a conversation with someone. Uh, uh, actually a journalist from the New York Times, and I was trying to convey what it was like in the 1980s, you know, what we were living through. And I was finding myself getting frustrated that this person wasn't you know, understanding it. And, um, uh, and I was realizing how, even though this was recent history, how quickly it could be forgotten and how easily it could be uh, manipulated or whitewashed. And I said to Mr. Burr, I said, you know, somebody has to do the memory. And as those words were coming out of my mouth, my mind sort of like totally changed. I and mean, it went from being resistant to writing about the epidemic to feeling compelled to, to do so. Uh, and, uh, uh, and part of this tour I'm on is encouraging others uh, to document their own experiences uh, with the epidemic. It's, I think, very important uh, that we go back and look at the earliest years of the epidemic and understand what happened then, uh, how our own community responded. One of the things I do in the book uh, is you know, we've been so in touch with the failings of the Reagan administration, the New York, the Koch administration, the pharmaceutical industry, the, the, uh, the media, all these institutions, um, but we haven't uh, looked as critically at our own community's leadership in response to the epidemic. Uh, in the earliest years, and I do that a bit in the book, not to vilify anyone or to blame anyone, uh, but to understand why we responded the way we did, and what, in hindsight, we can learn from that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, two passages from the book. Um, uh, one is from a letter uh, I wrote to my parents in October of 1979. Uh, right after the uh, first national march on, on Washington for gay and lesbian rights. I'm sure Tracy was there. <laughs> Almost. Oh, there I was in college. I was in high school. <laughs> oh, that's right. Such a, such a young student. Uh, and uh, 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 so we're going to read from that letter. Uh, but this was just a year after I had come out to my parents and about three years after I first kind of came out to myself and started to uh, have friends. I grew up in Iowa City, 
And when I was 17, I went to Washington to uh, uh, work in the U.S. Senate, running a senator's only elevator in the Capitol building. And I was a political junkie. And for a political junkie, that job was like living every day with a contact high because I was in literally close proximity in an elevator <laughs> with uh, members of, of Congress and Supreme Court justices and cabinet officials and VIPs every day. And, uh, but at the same time, I was starting to deal with coming out and with dealing with being attracted to men. And I come from a very Catholic background. My three sisters' first names are all Mary because of my father's devotion to the Virgin Mother. Uh, my mother, my own mother, was raised by nuns. She was an orphan when she was two years old. And I was, uh, at the age of 13, I went to a Jesuit boarding school in Wisconsin and briefly thought I had a call to the priesthood. So that was a lot of uh, stuff to kind of dig through to, uh, uh, to deal with, with my sexual desire. Uh, and as I started to come out in Washington, I came out into a milieu of uh, very deeply closeted uh, political people, uh, staff members for members of Congress, and actually members of Congress themselves, and people who work at trade associations in a very closeted city in Washington. And I started to, oh, thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'm running out of hand. Uh, uh, and as uh, uh, I started reading the Washington Blade uh, community media and how important it is, and I started to feel this disconnect between the gay people I was meeting uh, who had no interest in gay politics, and even bring anything up about gay politics was to stigmatize yourself and not be invited back to the next party, uh, because these were all mostly politically ambitious uh, uh, people who wanted to stay as far away from anybody knowing they were gay as possible. Uh, so I became kind of unhappy with that disconnect, and um, not long after Hardy Milk was murdered, I decided to move to New York, where I was starting to meet people who were um, uh, much more open about being gay and, and much more political. So in the fall of 79, I went back to Washington for the March on Washington. I get back to my apartment in New York. Is this on? Should be. So. I think you just have to hold it for it. How's that? Uh, I don't know if it's on. Let's see. It's like a little mini thing, but. There you go. Yeah, you just have to. Okay. All right. I don't know. Does it make any difference? Do I need it? I just. You can just talk about it. Okay. All right. I'll just, I'll just hold there, it as a prompt. Well, it's up to you. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it just took a minute to kick in. For the, for the several tape recorders here, we'll, we'll use this. Um, and so I went back to, to Washington for the March on Washington. It was a very important experience for me, transformational for me personally, in terms of a sense of pride, a sense of, of community. I'd never seen so many gay people in my life. Uh, I also met two people who became very important in my life, a journalist named Doug Ireland, who uh, died not long ago. And Ethan Ghetto, uh, who ran the campaign against Anita Bryant's Save Our Children effort in Dade County to repeal the, the Dade County uh, Human Rights Ordinance. So I get back home to my apartment in New York. It's my parents' anniversary. And being a generous, thoughtful son for their anniversary, I decide to address my sexuality. Uh, <laughs> and when I re returned to New York after the march on Washington, I wrote a long letter to my parents. It's been one year since I told you about an important part of me in my life. Mom, the night I told you, we cried as though it were the end of something. I think you foresaw a very sad future. I hope in the year that has passed, you've realized for me it's not a sad thing, but a very happy thing. And then for the first time with them, I framed my sexual orientation in political terms and presented myself as part of the gay rights movement. My new boldness also came from a change in thinking about my own career. I wrote, if my lifestyle prevents me from running for political office or from living without scandal in Iowa City, so be it. I've accepted that. No one can ever blackmail me, and I'll know I'm helping towards the day when there won't be 15, 16, 17-year-old gay men and women committing suicide or feeling self-hatred. I began this letter as a greeting card, noting their wedding anniversary. But once I began, everything I needed to say kept spilling out of me, and I ultimately sent them a fat envelope with the card and four or five additional handwritten pages. It would be easy for us to get along the rest of my life with your only acknowledgement of my gayness to be when you might occasionally meet a friend or lover, 
but I desperately want it to be more than that. The more the world I see, the prouder I am of being an Iowan, Catholic, and your son. I took a while to put this long emotional letter in the mail. I unsealed the envelope and reread what I had written twice before taping it shut and dropping it in a mailbox. Every day I hoped to find a message on my answering machine or a letter from them. But like my gayness itself, the letter was acknowledged only when I brought it up, which I did when I called them about 10 days later. But it wasn't discussed and I was disappointed. Two decades later, I found this and other letters I'd sent my parents in a folder that my father had kept with my school records. The original was accompanied by, in the file by a typed version my father had his secretary transcribe, carefully replacing names of famous politicians I'd outed with XXXXX. Although, as an aside, at the time, outed wasn't something that we, anyone would have known what that meant. Uh, when I asked him why he had it typed up, he said, maybe I thought it was important. Rereading the letter today, over 30 years later, I'm struck by how resolute I was about my sexual identity during a period when other aspects of my life were chaotic and unfocused. I got by but did not excel at Georgetown and was repeating that pattern at Columbia. Any foundation I had established for a traditional political career was in jeopardy because of my growing gay activism. I had discovered sex and pursued it enthusiastically is sometimes in ways that were degrading, opportunistic, or self-destructive. I was a whirling dervish of activity, involved in many things, but without any structure or plan. I wanted to do something significant with my life, but I couldn't articulate what the possibilities were. Yet, of the importance of LGBT liberation in my life, I had no doubt. So that was in 1979. Uh, shortly after that, uh, I was infected, of course I didn't know it at the time, uh, probably it was in the summer of 1980. And uh, within several years after the epidemic hit in 1981, I was pretty uh, immersed in uh, the uh, advocacy of the work in New York. By 1985, I had been formally diagnosed and was uh, very involved with the People of AIDS Coalition in New York and the self empowerment movement advocacy that preceded ACT UP. Most of you are probably familiar with ACT UP. One of the things I like to talk about is how the activism that preceded ACT UP was, uh, was fundamentally different, in my view, from ACT UP's advocacy. And in some ways, it was more radical. Uh, both were important to me. But uh, I did become very involved in ACT UP. And so 10 years later, almost exactly 10 years after I wrote that letter to my parents, I was nervously sitting in a pew in December of 1989. Uh, near the front of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, where John Cardinal O'Connor was about to celebrate Mass. It had been years since I attended a Catholic Mass, and even longer since I took communion, the holiest of sacraments, but that was why I was there. Looking up at the cathedral's soaring nave, I remember the awe I felt as an altar boy at St. Mary's in Iowa City, and later the anger when the church betrayed me. It is bitterly cold, a near record low. Many parishioners wear heavy coats as they hold hymnals in gloved hands. Slush-covered boots have left a wet trail down the long center aisle. There's a puddle under my pew. The mood in the church is tense, nothing like the droning boredom of the masses of my youth. As the minutes pass, I think of the Jesuits who taught me as a child that a good Catholic acts upon the church's social teachings, even if that means confronting the church. My hands are trembling with the cold, my apprehension and other feelings too deep to name. Outside St. Patrick's, 4,500 angry men and women have assembled, packing Fifth Avenue and chanting and waving placards that read, Curb your dogma, papal bull, and condoms, not coffins. Fists pump the air, bullhorns blare, act up, the AIDS coalition to unleash power, is protesting O'Connor's assault on safe sex and reproductive rights. There's an almost carnival-like spirit to the demonstration with act up affinity groups, such as Church Ladies for Choice, the Hail Marys, and speaking in tongues, performing their protests. In ACT UP, high camp and high seriousness are uniquely compatible. An artist named Ray Navarro is dressed as Jesus Christ, swathed in a white shroud, carrying a large wooden cross over his near skeletal shoulder. His bearded face is gone, and he wears a crown of thorns over his long, thinning hair. Despite the cold, Ray looks beatific. He'll be dead in less than a year. 
Keith Haring is there too, in a knitted cap with a long hand knitted scarf wrapped around his slender neck. He has two months left. Inside the cathedral, O'Connor's mass is interrupted again and again by act up protesters. Surreptitiously spread throughout the church, they stand up and yell out their statements. My friend Michael Petrellis climbs on a pew and shouts, O'Connor, you're killing us! Another friend, Jamie Leo, dressed as a priest near the front of the church, offers up a prayer in protest. Two boyfriends in black leather motorcycle jackets handcuff themselves to one pew. Right after O'Connor begins his homily, 30 protesters stage a die-in, blowing whistles, throwing hundreds of condoms in the air, and going limp in the center aisle. The cops, two long lines of blue on either side of the cathedral, have their moment, binding wrists with plastic handcuffs and carrying the protesters away on stretchers, as if they were taking them to a hospital rather than to paddy wagons. With his homily in tatters, O'Connor retreats from the altar to his throne-like chair, he sits with his head in his hands, melodramatically trying to convey spiritual pain. Photographs of the media savvy cardinal looking tragic with the siege will elicit overwhelming sympathy when they appear on the front page of Monday's newspapers. Communion begins amid the general confusion. Act up protesters line up, interspersed among the regular parishioners. But when it is their turn, they make loud political pronouncements. Safe sex is moral sex. I support a woman's right to choose. Condoms save lives. Soon it is my turn to receive the body and blood of Christ. A small, dark-skinned priest is serving my cue. His white, green, and gold vestments are oversized and bright. He hesitates briefly, his eyes fixed on the pink triangle and silence equals death logo visible on the t-shirt underneath my coat. Then he holds the host in the air and intones with a strong Spanish accent, the body of Christ. This is the moment, my moment, to confront the church. When instead of responding as expected, I am to make my political statement, but I have not prepared one. When I rehearse this moment in my mind, I imagine I might break into tears or erupt in rage, because no slogan, in fact no words at all, seemed adequate. May the Lord bless the man I love, who died a year ago this week, I hear myself say. My voice begins as a tremble, but finishes strong. Police standing a few feet away are ready to intervene, watching to see how the priest reacts. His hand jerks slightly, but he looks me in the eye and gives me the wafer. With my heart pounding, I walk back to my pew. My mind is fixed on bodies, but not the body of Christ. I think of Michael's body and the agonizing brain infection that turned his last days into a kind of crucifixion. I think of the bodies of the protesters carried out on stretchers and those chanting outside, many struggling to survive. I think of my own body, wondering how much longer it will last. Parishioners are staring at me, their faces disgusted or sympathetic or just plain stunned. Some have their heads bowed, hands pressed tightly in prayer like the devout at St. Mary's, their faith unshakable and unwilling to brook any criticism of the church. They might be praying for us, after Mass, I pass through the cathedral's heavy doors into the bright sunlight and, it seems to me, into the arms of my true community. I am exultant in a state that feels like grace, certain that if I am to die of AIDS, I will die as a fighter, not a victim. So, uh, from there, I became very deeply involved in ACT UP and in other demonstrations. Uh, uh, I will say a couple of quick things about that demonstration. It was the most controversial thing ACT UP, I think, ever did, including on the floor of ACT UP. That whole summer preceding it, it was a battle there. People who felt very strongly that we should never interrupt a religious service, that it didn't matter what the service was, who they were, uh, that that was inappropriate. Um, and others of us were arguing that the, the church was, was being really murderous. You know, this was at a time that not only was the church uh, intervening and preventing safe sex education in, in public high schools in New York, but they were running ads uh, in the subways. They had ads in the subways claiming that condoms don't work, that they had a 50 and 60 percent uh, breakage rate, failure rate. They, you know, Catholic hospitals and clinics 
could not tell people how to protect themselves from HIV, could not discuss condoms, let alone distribute them. Uh, but we ultimately decided to do the demonstration in partnership with the Women's Health Action Mobilization. And the morning after the demonstration, by 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, virtually every major LGBT organization and AIDS organization had their press releases out. The fax machines were busy condemning us, distancing themselves from us. Uh, GMHC in New York, uh, American Foundation for AIDS Research, Human Rights Campaign Fund. Uh, but there's something very important. 110 people were arrested that day. And if you look at the roster of those who were arrested, you learn something very important that I think changes uh, one's perception of what that action was about. Roughly half the people inside the church, half the people arrested were arrested inside the church, interrupting the service. And about half of them were arrested outside the church on uh, Fifth Avenue protesting. The names of the people arrested inside the church are a preponderance of names that are Irish, that are Polish, that are Italian, people who grew up culturally Catholic, many of whom were actually still devout Catholics as well. Because we felt like we had a right, you know, even though I didn't identify as a Catholic and was no longer going to, to Mass, I've been to more than a thousand Masses. You know, my, I write elsewhere in the book that my parents' uh, political ideology was irrelevant compared to their, uh, to how the church defined their lives. Uh, so I felt like I had a right to go there and to take my redress directly to them. Uh, the second thing I, I like to point out is that in the 25 years since that action, this will be the 25th anniversary this, this uh, December, uh, I think its importance has only increased uh, and the respect for the action has increased over the years. At the time, no one supported it except those of us who were there. Uh, but now, looking back, uh, I see that action of, as particular importance historically. You know, in 1969, when the Stonewall uh, riots in New York happened, it was the first time that the gay community in New York had ever pushed back against the civil code that oppressed us, pushed back against the state. Well, 20 years later at St. Patrick's, that was the first time that we ever pushed back against the religious code that oppressed us in such a direct way, pushed back against the church. Uh, I also think that sort of coincided uh, and maybe helped uh, with the period when a peak importance and influence of the Catholic Church in, uh, in American politics and society. Still is enormously important, but not nearly like it was uh, 25 years ago. Uh, the last thing I'll say about that is: uh, uh, Do people know who Keith Haring was, the pop artist? You know, with the, with the line drawings, very bright figures, the crawling baby, and the glowing dog, and so on. Um, uh, Keith um, uh, a lot of us knew Keith was sick. Um, Keith and I were actually born the same month in 1958 and moved to New York in the same month in 1979. And uh, we knew each other. And he had been very generous in donating images when I was involved with the Proposition 64, uh, fighting Proposition 64 in California, which was a measure on the ballot to quarantine people with HIV, something a lot of people forget about today don't, or don't understand how close we came to being uh, put in camps. Uh, and then Keith, uh, I asked him to, to do an image for National Coming Out Day, if you've ever seen that image of the stick figure stepping out the door. Um, and then he did something uh, for ACT UP, finally. But we've been trying to get him to come to ACT UP meetings, and he wouldn't come to the meetings. And he was keeping his diagnosis a secret. Um, and as he told me, it wasn't that he really cared about people knowing, but he had seen what happened after Andy Warhol died and Jean-Michel Basquiat died. And he saw the intense speculation in their work. And he said the vultures, they, they were you know, just circling around their, their, their carcasses. Uh, and he said he knew that was going to happen when he died. But he didn't want to have to witness it while he was alive. Um, and at one point, Keith and I were talking, and uh, uh, he was asking about Michael Callan. And I told him Michael was very, uh, was, had been diagnosed with Kaposi's sarcoma. And I started to explain to him what Kaposi sarcoma was. This was before I had it myself. And he said, oh, I know. And he lifted, we were actually in a hotel room, he lifted up his pajamas 
and showed me, and he had chaos lesions that were the size of my hand on, on both legs, on his shins, his legs, that were, were black and waxy with the necrotizing uh, 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 tissue on it, that were probably about the most intense and worst lesions I've ever seen on somebody who was still uh, able to stand upright. Um, however, it was the St. Patrick's action that got him to finally start coming to ACT UP meetings. <laughs> and it was specifically, it was a poster that Victor Mendolia and, um, and Richard Deagle created. It was ACT UP were known for pretty cool graphics, right? Still are. Uh, but this poster, even in that context, was kind of special. Um, it was a black and white and red. I have an image of it in the book. And, and two uh, photographic images and a headline and small so that, uh, The image on the left was of Cardinal O'Connor wearing his mitre with a pointed hat that Cardinals wear. Uh, and the image on the right was roughly the same size and shape, but it was of a flattened out used condom. And the headline across the top of the poster said, No Your Scumbags. <laughs> and underneath the condom, in very small letters, it said, this one prevents AIDS. Uh, so when a friend of, of, of Keith's took that poster to him after an act up meeting one night, they said he just cracked up. He could not get over it. He said, oh, I have to come and see. He just thought that was so cool. And, uh, and that day, uh, he was outside the church. He was emaciated. Uh, he, you know, I remember it was an incredibly cold day, very powerful wind blowing down the about it. And he had this knit scarf wrapped around his neck, it must have been three or four times. Uh, and you know, he was very, very sick, and he died about two months later. Uh, but I, I like to tell that because it sort of uh, illustrates how important that advocacy was to us uh, at that time. Uh, and the very last thing I'll say uh, about that was that I'm always struck by the remarkable similarities between ACT UP and the Catholic Church. Uh, both uh, have weekly meetings held at the same place at the same time. Uh, both have their own chants and customs and uh, peculiarities. And of course, both are presided over uh, by a man in the front of the room wearing a dress. <laughs> uh, so I go on and talk about uh, uh, other uh, activism, including some actions that were a little more fun, not quite as intense as that one, uh, like when we put a gigantic 35-foot condom over U.S. Senator Jesse Helms's two-story brick colonial home in suburban Washington. And the side of it, when it was fully erect, you could read, uh, protect yourself from unsafe politics, Jesse Helms is more dangerous than the virus. Um, and then uh, uh, going on my ran for Congress in 1990, uh, as the first openly HIV positive person to do so, um, produced a play called The Night Letter Covered Kissed Me, and then openly started Paz Magazine. And uh, so the story of that, and then getting very sick, um, about 18 or 19 years ago, I weighed uh, 41 or 42 pounds less than I weigh right now. My viral load was 3.3 million. My CD4 count was one. Uh, I like to point out it was a pretty good one. But, uh, and I had capsaic sarcoma all over my face and in my lungs, and it turned work. And so I was, you know, among the really fortunate who uh, survived long enough to be there when uh, combination therapy came out and to have had access to it and to have responded to it. Um, and then I told a bit about, you know, what happened after that when my health started to come back and the advocacy I'm engaged in today around combating HIV criminalization and, and trying to re uh, uh, invigorate the empowerment movement for, for people with HIV as a strategy to uh, combating stigma and improving health outcomes.